It's a pleasure to invite Professor Dominic Goodall. <coughs> As Professor Sriram mentioned in the morning, he is a graduate from Oxford studying Sanskrit in Pali. Then he worked uh, with, uh, on Tamil with Professor Srinivasan in Hamburg, returned to Oxford, and under Professor Sanderson, he produced a critical edition of Bhatta Rama, Rama Ramakantha's Kirana Tantra. I am unfamiliar with the subject. And he was with the French Institute of Pondicherry for some time, but he has been mainly associated with the EFFO, which he will spell for us, the French School of Asian Studies. He was uh, its head till 2011, and he has again come back uh, to have an association with EFFO. And he has been working with uh, Professor Rastelli in Vienna on a dictionary of tantric terminology, Tantrika Vidhana Kosha, and he has been contributing to the Hamburg Encyclopedia of Manuscript Cultures in Asia and Africa. It's wonderful to have you, Professor Goodall, here. I look forward to your lecture. Thank you very much, sir, for that introduction. And thank you very much, indeed, to uh, Professor Senior Tadas for his uh, invitation. <coughs> uh, I'm afraid my lecture is not nearly so well planned and timed as Professor Danino's was. Uh, you may simply have to stop me when we reach uh, one hour. Thank you very much. <laughs> Is it possible to put it full screen? Yes, so the first indication of slight disorganization is that this uh, beautiful inscription here, it's a Cambodian inscription. It was one I had intended to put a number of slides in about, but I forgot to do so. So I will not speak about this inscription, in fact. Uh, my idea was because uh, my colleague, Dr. S. S. Sharma, will be speaking tomorrow about the collections of manuscripts in Pondicherry, I thought that I would instead try to speak a bit about some of the impact that th what we have gathered from these collections, some of the impact on wider religious history. Very briefly though, uh, the collection is uh, uh, basically of uh, Grunter script manuscripts and um, it was recognized by UNESCO as a collection, uh, Memory of the World collection in 2005. And um, uh, it's much smaller than many of these collections that Professor Dash was speaking about. No lacks and lacks of manuscripts, just a very small collection. It seems huge to us. I mean, it's 11,000 documents. Uh, most of them were collected in the uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s by uh, Pandit N. R. Bhatt. So, sorry, I don't know whether you can read that. It says 8,600 manuscri ma 8, manuscripts at the IFP, that's the French Institute of Pondicherry, and uh, 1,670 manuscripts at the EFEO, that's my institution, which is just next door, uh, another French uh, government research institution. Yes, the, the, na the names of them, the École Française Extrême Orient and the logos. And uh, this is where it is in Pondicherry, if you should ever come. Um, Pandit Enard Bhatt uh, was employed, so Jean Filiouza has been mentioned uh, several times in the last uh, communication. Jean Filiouza, in a way, asked himself the, qu the fundamental question, what is a Shaiva temple? Who goes there? Why? What are the theologies behind uh, the practice in Shaiva temples? And for this nexus of questions that related to this question, what is a Shaiva temple? Uh, he gathered then a lot of materials. He started in the 1960s, and primarily he uh, uh, sent out Pandit Enal Bhatt, uh, whom many of you will have known, uh, into the Tamil countryside looking for manuscripts basically with the idea that we should be gathering materials on Shaivism. 
Why Shaivism? Well, there's so many other things, but it is true that uh, looking from the point of view of religious history in the 19th century, the primary interest had been a quest for origins and attempts to tackle the Vedic corpus, the Upanishads, the Brahmanas, the earliest history. And there was a strong prejudice, I would say, against uh, investigating the history of the Mantra Marga, that's to say, the history of Tantrism. And uh, this meant that there was much less understanding in the 1960s of the history of Shaivism and of Tantric Pancharatra, Tantric uh, Buddhism, and so forth. So, uh, and here in the Tamil country, of course, there are a lot of uh, early Shaiva temples. And uh, so, th with this in mind, uh, they decided they would gather manuscripts of primarily Shaiva texts. And so that's why we have a very small collection, uh, small by the comparison standards uh, that, we w that Professor Dash was speaking of earlier today. Uh, but it's, and it's relatively focused. Of course, there are many other materials in amongst these manuscripts. And in a way, um, so I'm showing you an old map. Uh, but what I wanted to focus on was this area here. Uh, what you see is labeled here, India Extra Gangem, on this map of, map of 1855, which means India beyond the Ganges. <laughs> uh, I want to emphasize how important the discoveries from the Shaiva collection of manuscripts have been for illuminating the religi his religious history of a much wider area and particularly Cambodia, because from Cambodia, uh, so uh, Professor Danino showed us um, an inscription uh, from Cambodia from dated to 605 uh, sh of the Shaka era. In fact, there are many manuscript, many uh, inscriptions. That particular inscription is in Khmer language, but there are many inscriptions in Sanskrit, and primarily uh, most of these inscriptions, so here's an example, uh, Yes, about 1,300 inscriptions in Sanskrit or Khmer or both dating from this period, from the 5th to the 13th century. And uh, there, in conjunction with that fact, there are no other surviving documents transmitted through manuscripts that date from this period from Cambodia. So in other words, everything is lost. Everything is lost except these inscriptions, almost all of them on stone, a few objects in metal that have been inscribed. Um, and most of these inscriptions uh, commemorate as the central act the Pratishtha, the installation of a linga. Of course, there are plenty of Vaishnava sculptures, plenty of other uh, statues of the goddess, uh, Buddhist uh, images, and so forth. But uh, I would say the majority of these inscriptions are basically about Shaiva temples. And uh, when all of these inscriptions started to uh, be discovered, there was a sort of uh, a gap, I would say, in uh, scientific knowledge about the history of the kinds of movements within Shaivism and Vaishnavism and Buddhism that produced this kind of temple-based uh, religious activity. Uh, the reason why I have this, this is a ninth century inscription, uh, and I cannot remember why I have it in this order, but I think that what I wanted to say was um, th this, this is a, ni a nice illustration of a list of subjects which a particular pundit knew. We have many of these in the inscriptions in the Cambodian epigraphical record. So here you see this man describes himself as so, Shaiva Jyotisha Shabdartha Vadi Shastra Tvedina Yenat Manta Nigudhopi Yogena Dadrishi Shive. So, uh, Yena is the subject of the uh, sentence. It's this man called Amara Bhava, a yati, uh, who knew the meanings of the shastras of Shaivism, that's Shaiva, Jyotisha, astronomy, uh, Shabda, uh, Artha, well, this may be statesmanship, Artha Shastra in this list, and uh, Nyaya, that's to say, if we understand Vadi Shastra to mean the science of disputants, in other words, of disputation. Um, and he perceived his own self in Shiva. So this is a piece of uh, Shiva theology, if you like, embedded in this account of uh, his knowledge, though hidden within uh, until Nirgud Hopi uh, by means of yoga, yogena. So uh, this is uh, illustrative of something else, uh, so what an important fact about these inscriptions. You really have, there is an enormous amount of Shaivism uh, or I, I should say medieval Indian religion embedded in these documents. 
And at the time when many of them were first published, so through the 1880s, 1890s, and then through the efforts of uh, Georges Cédès, who's been mentioned, uh, at that time, there was not much published literature or translated literature to which the scholars who uncovered these documents and published them could refer in order to interpret uh, the meanings of these inscriptions. And in a way, I would say it is uh, Jean Filiusa, in asking this question about South Indian temples, who managed to make a sort of bridge between uh, the activities of the scholars who had worked on Cambodian inscriptions and uh, the study of uh, South India. Not just, of course, South India, but primarily South India. Yes, uh, here's another example, much later, 12th century. Um, and again, uh, yes, I think, sorry, just to go back one second. I think it's rather strikingly different from many uh, classical Indian lists. Uh, that's to say, lists that are found on the Indian subcontinent that talk about people's shastras. So we're used to seeing, um, what is the expression? Padavakya pramana gyaha. So knowledgeable in pada grammar, vakya mimamsa, and pramana, i.e. nyaya. Uh, these Cambodian lists are much, much more varied, but very often we find Shaivism in amongst them. So in this list, uh, it's Siddhanta Tarka Muni Sammata Shabda Shastra Vedartha Pancha Jaladheen Pibatisma Hridyam Pito Jhitaika Saritam Patir Ashutavat Chihraya Kim Kilana Kumbha Bhavopi Yasmin Yes, uh, so the structure is Kumbha Bhavopi Augusta would not even Kinkila Nakumba Bhavopi would not even Augusta have felt shame Jihraya in front of this man Yasmin. Why? Because uh, Kumba Bhava, that's to say Augusta, was Pito Jhitaika Saritampati. He was one who had swallowed and then actually spat out again just one ocean. <laughs> Whereas uh, this man apparently uh, he's somebody called Subhadra. Uh, but had received the consecration, the initiation name, Murdashiva. He had drunk all of these oceans, uh, Pibotisma, these five oceans, namely Siddhanta Tarka, and probably Muni Sammata Shabda Shastra is one item, and uh, Veda Artha. So the ocean of Veda, the ocean of Artha Shastra, uh, the ocean of grammar, agreed upon by the sage Panini, Muni Sammata. Of course, one could understand the, tri the Trimunis, but I think the Trimuni idea comes through Hari Bhadra a little bit later. This is perhaps probably just one Muni, uh, namely Panini. And uh, Tarka, probably Nyaya and Vaisheshika. Siddhanta, I think, uh, from context, we can see that this refers to the Shaiva Siddhanta. Uh, and so it's a very unusual configuration of Shastras again. I think I could point, point you more passages in which that show that it's clearly Shaiva Siddhanta, not some other Siddhanta like astronomy or something. Um, okay, so I'm going to take you on a voyage. Here we are in, uh, this is not Cambodia, in fact, this is north of Cambodia, this is in Laos. Uh, is this some way, perhaps it's this thing, yes, here. So this is this enormous mountain which was famous from the fifth century throughout the Southeast Asian Peninsula as the Linga Parvata, the mountain of the Linga. Uh, I, sorry, I'm pointing up there, I'm not sure whether it was this summit or that summit, but anyway, one of these summits on this mountain was held to be a Linga. And uh, we have uh, a fifth century inscription recording this fact, and we have seventh century inscriptions, and we have eighth and ninth, and so forth. And uh, here at the bottom, uh, you see two great big lakes, and then this is climbing up the slope, and around about here, there is an ancient shrine uh, of Shiva, Bhadrishwara, uh, which was the focal site of Shaiva devotion throughout the Khmer. Uh, Sorry, the, the area under the control of Khmer-speaking monarchs for a number of centuries. Um, so here we are at the bottom. Uh, there's the, these two enormous ranges of buildings on either side. Uh, this just gives you an impression. Here's climbing up uh, on the, above those lakes. Uh, and then I'm afraid we're not going to the top, sorry. I was going to show you instead this discovery, which was made in 2013. It's a four-sided inscription. Uh, previously unpublished, and uh, announced here in the Vientiane Times. Uh, it turns out to be, uh, yes, from January 2013. It turns out, to, and it's been it's dis the circumstances of its discovery here in the ground have been written up, uh, I'm afraid, in an article in French. 
And uh, since then, we've actually published this document. Uh, and it turns out to be a 10th century inscription which records the taxes of the region around the temple, which are to be paid annually to Bhadrishwar, to Shiva, uh, um, from the period of the, from the installation of the inscription. No, no, this is the actual text. So um, what I was going to do was just show you some verses of this which illustrate that one needs to take into account uh, a Shaiva background in order to understand it. So it's beautifully lettered. And uh, it's a bit mysterious how it got to be in the ground at this place. Uh, <laughs> and furthermore, absolutely upright. But it must have been there a long time, perhaps soon after its creation, because the state of pres preservation is nearly perfect. You can re read every akshara undamaged from the stone itself. You don't need to uh, uh, postulate, have hypotheses. It's very, very clear. It's very unique. Khmer. No, the, lang the script is indeed Khmer, but the Khmer script, uh, it's one of the things that Professor Danino could have mentioned. The scripts, of course, of most of Southeast Asia are simply South Indian, for South Indian no. Brahmi in, yes, I mean, historically, it goes back to South Indian Brahmi. One can document that through each change over a number of decades. The earliest, the earliest inscriptions from Cambodia really are indistinguishable from documents produced in South India or on the Eastern Littoral. The, the script is simply the same. Um, yes, so this is the, uh, the first uh, 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 verse. I don't know whether you can see, uh, I mean here, there's, there's a sort of uh, liminal decoration. And then uh, yes, ye ch yes, ye you might be able to see. I mean, with a little bit of practice, you can read it's really the same thing as South Indian uh, Brahmi. Yes, ye chaya nalina jadi trinava sana vishwod bhavas titi tiro bhavanani kali jayante eva nikilani namos to tasmai chaitanya shakti vapushe parameshwaraya. Yes, so. Uh, my point here was that this expression, Chaitanya Shakti, uh, Chaitanya Shakti Vapushe, is the kind of thing you could puzzle over a lot. It could mean various different things. But I think that uh, with an understanding of uh, the Shaiva Siddhanta, uh, which clearly was the dominant school of uh, Cambodia in and around the 10th century, I mean, I would say from between the end of the 8th century and the 13th, it seems to have been the dominant school, but not the only one, among Shaiva schools in uh, Cambodia. From with the knowledge of that, you can see that uh, Chaitanya Shakti refers to the powers that are God. So God has as his body, Vapush, he has the Shakti, which is Chaitanya. And Chaitanya Shakti is defined in various arguments, so maybe I should read out the translation. Veneration to that Supreme Lord, Parameshwaraya, who is embodied, Vapushe, in his powers, Shakti, of knowledge and action. That's my translation for the moment of Chaitanya. I'll come back to that. By whose will, Yasye uh, Chaya, the creation, maintenance, and dissolution, that's Udbhava Stiti Tiro Bhavanani, of the universe, Vishwa, from Brahma down to clods of grass, so that's Nalina Jadi Trinavasana, take place in due time, Kali. So in other words, the creation takes place in its due time, appointed time, in accordance with the will, Icha Shakti, of uh, Ishwara. So veneration to him who is Chaitanya Shakti Vapushe. Um, yes, Chaitanya as Shakti is defined in various Siddhanta Tantras, which, uh, as being the combination of omniscience and omnipotence. Drik kriya rupam, you see there in the first quotation. Gyatva kartita rupam, in the second one. And drik uh, kriya shakti, in the third quotation. So my point is, uh, it's only through this large collection of manuscripts in Pondicherry, then an effort to catalogue, and then all the editing that has gone on, we have gradually come to have a picture of some of the theology of the uh, Shaiva Siddhanta, to see that it's very differentiated in time, and then it is finally th starting to throw a light on uh, some of these inscriptions. This one is one uh, which has never been uh, published before. Yes, at the same site, this is next to the uh, 
shrine. It's not a 7th century sculpture. Uh, it's a much later sculpture. I don't know the exact date of it. But um, you can probably... Re it's always very difficult to recognize iconography from different regions of the Indian world. If you're familiar with South India, this does not look very familiar. But I think you can see that the figure on the left here has uh, four heads, or th three visible heads. This is meant to be Brahma with an Akshamala. That's not so clear to me. And this is meant to be uh, Vishnu. And this is meant to be Sadashiva, with the five heads uh, arranged in this unusual fashion and ten arms. Uh, so in this, Sadashiva, you may know, is supposed to be the divinity whom, whom one visualizes inside the linga in according to the Shaiva Siddhanta. So in each shrine uh, in which there is a linga uh, founded according to the Shaiva Siddhanta, the deity whom you are supposed to uh, see when you worship inside the linga is Sadashiva. There are not so many representations from this area of, uh, of India, but from Bengal and Bangladesh, uh, many uh, Sadashivas have been discovered. And uh, there are quite a number in Cambodia, usually standing, whereas all the ones known to me from the Indian subcontinent are seated. Okay, this is just to remind you, in case uh, you've forgotten where we are. This, uh, you, uh, so we've been up here in Vatpu, in the south of Laos, which is where, as I was saying, this extraordinary Shaiva temple uh, with a great big mountain that has been recognized as Linga Parvata is. Um, uh, I'm going to move further down to the south. Sorry, this is another historical map showing some of the uh, significant features. So up here is Vatpu. Uh, here's the Mekong River. This is this enormous seasonal lake in the middle of uh, Cambodia. That's the famous uh, conurbation, uh, Angkor, now known as Angkor because of this one, uh, well, the history of the name Angkor is too complicated to go into. But in any case, uh, this is the site of uh, Angkor Wat and many, many other ancient temples. Um, this is the modern capital of Phnom Penh, and in the river delta we have all these, a lot of the most ancient sites with some of the oldest inscriptions are uh, uh, gathered here in the south of the country uh, in the uh, river delta, suggesting, well, patterns of trade, I think. Uh, so the reason why I was coming to, Ang I, I wanted to bring us down to uh, Angkor, to this area. This is another inscription uh, discovered in not discovered, but uncovered and taken to a museum in 2002. So here it is uh, inside, a resting in a, in a ruin inside the jungle, outside the archaeological park in Angkor. Uh, this one is still unpublished, quite a, an enormous uh, stone, as you can see. And uh, this is the transport out of the jungle. Uh, quite an operation to get it there. And there was great excitement. In stampages were made in 2002, but you can see almost nothing, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, so it has remained unpublished for, uh, yes, well, uh, 15 years. But uh, it's actually not so bad to read uh, um, when you actually s examine the object with lots of raking light and things. And so... Um, with a colleague in Paris who died, unfortunately, last year, Claude Jacques, we started to, uh, to work on it. And um, this is the opening. Uh, it's still unpublished, this one. It's uh, 12th century. So I show you this partly because there are things about this that puzzle me, and maybe somebody will be able to explain uh, some parts of this. Shiva Moldha Bhishikta Ya Vak Eka Kasha Gamini Vaikhadyadi Tridha Bhinna Sa Gangeva Punatu Vaha. Okay, so it's a slightly complicated verse, but Vark is compared to Ganga, and they are both described with the same attributes. Shiva Muldha Bishikta and Vaikaryadi Tridha Bhinna. They're split into three paths, beginning with Vaikari. So this is a reference, of course, you will recognize this as a reference to uh, Bhartri Hari's notion of uh, Vaikari. Well, whether it's Bhartri Hari's or not, or something, somebody preceding Bhartri Hari is not known. But I think what is clear about the history of uh, Bhartri Hari's thought of dividing speech into some uh, coarse Vaikari, uh, Madhyama, this central stage, and then a subtle uh, um, uh, Pashyanti type. This is something which is largely forgotten in many other traditions. That's to say it's not much used or quoted outside Shaivism. In Shaivism, this had a very long and strong importance. Anyway, I'll come back to that in a minute. Second verse. Parvati, Parvati, Nathau, Sampriktau, Yoni, Bijavat, 
Lokartutpadanakarao-pitarao-jagatam-name. So here you will of course recognize that this is a, uh, a, a play on the opening verse, one of the most famous opening verses of all Sanskrit works, the opening verse of the Raghuvamsha. Uh, but it's a strange play. It's, well, first of all, there's this clever Parvati, Parvati Nata, uh, which is, m I think, it's possible that this formulation is meant to exclude anything Vaishnava, because you may know that uh, this verse, uh, the original verse, is sometimes read, uh, this Parvati Parameshwara is sometimes read as Parvati Pa Rameshwara. Yes, also, I think there are many variants on Meshwara, indeed, yes, Parvati Pa. So, in order to exclude that, we have this formulation which really does not allow that pun, <laughs> or any of those puns. So, Parvati and Parvati Nata, I venerate them, the parents of the universe, Pitarao Jagatam Nami, that's the familiar part. Lokato uh, Padana Karao, that seems also fine, I, who perform the uh, creation of, uh, yes, well, Lokato, uh, the different ways we could interpret that. They are Sampriktao, again, the same word that Kalinasi uses, and Yoni Bijavat, like Yoni and Bija. So what I think that this is alluding to is uh, an early tantric division into vowels and consonants. And, and it's something that we find in uh, the Nishwasa Tattu Samhita, which, is, uh, which we've recently published from Pondicherry, the first volume. And it's not found actually in many other tantric scriptures. But the Nishwasa, curiously, is one of the uh, few inscriptions which is mentioned by name three or four times in the Cambodian corpus. It's clearly one of those texts that they read. And furthermore, uh, in this place, this inscription actually belongs to a family of Acharyas who mention the fact that one of their number composed a commentary on a part of the Nishwasa. So I think that this allusion here very probably is to the notion that uh, the yoni <laughs> Uh, it refers to the vowels and bija to the consonants, which is a doctrine, I, w I think, unique, in fact, to the Nishwasa, but I think it comes back here in this, uh, in this inscription. Um, yes, so here's the, the mention that I've made of this guhyadi tikakari shri bhupindra kavi pungavaha. So this, uh, in fact, it's actually in this inscription itself, we have the reference to somebody who is a bhupindra kavi, uh, who uh, composed kari, a commentary, tika, on such texts as the guhya. Guhya is one of the main sutras of a huge vol voluminous text of the Nishwasa corpus. Yes, I seem to put the other reference. Uh, this is the another inscription which refers of the 12th century, which refers to the same man, and again refers to this uh, same uh, commentary. So, Bhupendra Pandita Padam Munimastakali Malana Tam Kajamiva Pranamantu Santa Samsara Sindhu Bhavanod Dharanaya Guhya Tika Pata Yadakarut Yamasadma Shunyam. So. Uh, May, have, may good people, Santa Pranamantu, bow before him, who is like Brahma himself, Kajamiva. He is Bhupendra Pandita Padam. Uh, he, uh, because, yat, in the last line, Akarot, he has rendered Akarot, Yama Sadma, the, the domain of Yama, empty, Shunyam. How has he emptied the hells? <laughs> He's emptied the hells, uh, Guhya Tika Pata, by means of a, of a commentary on the Guhya. So this same idea here. I won't go to the other parts of this inscription. Well, I think I'm taking that to mean uh, like Brahma himself, Kajamiva. It's true that Kajja should mean like a lotus, but we have a few other occurrences where Kajja or Kanja is used as though it were Kajja Ja. Uh, so Pushkaraja or something. As though, so I think that it has to mean Brahma. Furthermore, there's another verse which I cannot show you where he is compared explicitly, rather somebody else in his lineage of Acharya is, is compared to Brahma for having four different faces from which he teaches the Shaiva Siddhanta, Kavya, and I forget what the other two things are. So his, this comparison with Brahma is uh, found elsewhere. But uh, maybe there are other interpretations possible. Uh, so yes, uh, 
for some reason, I'm not sure of the sequence here, but anyway, here's the translation of this. I bow before Parvati and the Lord of Parvati, the parents of the universe, who are intertwined like vowels and consonants, Yoni Bijavat, and who, like vowels and consonants, give rise to the possibility of meaning in the world. So this is a possible interpretation of this local Lokartu Padana Karao. Uh, and then here's translation of this one. Um, so may language, Vak, purify you, Punatu Vaha, she who is consecrated by the mantras that are the heads of Shiva. So that's Shiva Murdhabi Shiktaya. So in a lot of both Atimarga, so Parshpata Shaivism and Mantra Marga Shaivism, there's a lot of importance given to the five Brahma mantras, which are the heads of Shiva, Tatpurusha, Vamadeva, Aghora, uh, Sadyojata, and Ishana. It's Sorry, I'm not sure which previous one. Yes, this one here, yes. No, this one is not that. This doesn't have Vagart. This is another verse which refers to the Guhya. Uh, I, sorry, I was quoting this. That's, that's this one we were on here. In fact, we don't have Vagart. It's this one. But we have Yoni Bijavat. Instead of Vagar Taviva, we have Yoni Bijavat, which is a somehow a slightly different claim. So in Kalidasa's original, sorry, you. Yeah, you know, I'm sure you can do other things. But the very fact you see that this man in this inscription it belongs to a family uh, accredited with interpreting the Nishwasa and refers to the Nishwasa in other places too. I think that this is a doctrine from the Nishwasa. But you could indeed interpret Yoni and Bija perhaps differently. In any case, I think that he has replaced uh, Kalidasa's original images, Vagar Taviva, like word and meaning. And I think that, well, that's very rich, of course, uh, in possible meanings. One of the ideas probably is this early definition of Kavya, that Kavya is that kind of writing in which both form and content are given this equal weight and both are equally beautiful. Uh, so, uh, but here he's got rid of that. Uh, he's used instead this idea of Yoni Bija. It's even more fundamental in a way than uh, 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 s s word and meaning. It's somehow the very substance of words themselves uh, which make uh, interaction, worldly interaction possible. Okay, yeah, please carry on. Please, I well, I don't mind uh, taking, if you have uh, questions, I... I no, no, it is not a question, Yeah. That is absolutely true, but there is very little evidence for Shaktism in Kashmir, in, in, sorry, in Cambodia at this time. Sorry, Professor Bahulka, you were going to say something. Yeah. I think that that is what was one is supposed to see first. So I think in many of these cases, these opening verses c contain hidden extra meanings behind them. And I, I'm now going to move on because I will show you some instances of that if I get to it. <laughs> uh, so I'm a little bit tempted to move past this, but it's such an interesting verse. May language purify you, she who is consecrated by the mantras that are the heads of Shiva. Now, I'm really, I must tell you that I'm not at all convinced by this meaning. Maybe you have a better idea, this Shiva Murdhabi Shikta. I think that we can see that when it's in the case of Ganga, so you see that my uh, translation in italics there is translating the pun, when the, paksha, the Ganga Paksha at the bottom. So who splashes the head of Shiva, Shiva Murdhabi Shikta, who is one when she moves in the ether, so Eka Akashigamini. So that's the notion that there's this heavenly celestial Ganges who is one. But she has three paths otherwise. She splits into three. Uh, who is divided into three courses. That's Tridha Bhinna. But now in the Ganga Paksha, I don't see how to take Vaikhadyadi. But maybe you have some idea. Yes, but the specifically Vaikhadyadi, is there any interpretation Vaikhadyadi you can give for Ganga? I mean, Tridha Bhinna is fine. That works for, th she's Tripathaga indeed. But uh, whether Vaikhari has any specific meaning that can be applied to Ganga? 
it may not be a total shlesha. True. That's also what I sort of guessed, but I was hoping you might be able to see some further meaning. <laughs> um, yeah, and indeed, well, we, I think when, you, so she is one, Eka, this Vak, who is uh, uh, like Ganga, when she climbs towards the subtlest sonic matter called Akasha. So there's a whole hierarchy of levels of sound for which we have many, many labels, and one of them is Akasha or Paramakasha. Uh, and yet she is divided lower down into these three levels of Vaikari and so forth. Okay, I'm going to move on from this richly <laughs> intriguing verse. I'm sure there is something I think there probably is, but uh, he could have omitted it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I'm going to skip this. This was to show you some instances of at the, at the tops, the summits of these inscriptions. Very often we have uh, tantric mantras, which might become relevant. This, for example, here is a hum, and you can see there's a chandra bindu and then the shikar, some of these elements which are named in tantric speculation about the increasingly subtle forms of sound when you perform a mantra or chara. Some of these have graphic representations on these, some of these inscriptions. Okay, so just, uh, this is not, you don't need to concentrate on Sanskrit for this. This is just one small point, another thing that shows the dominance of the Shaiva Siddhanta in uh, relative dominance, not total dominance, to the exclusion of all things. But the importance of uh, the Shaiva Siddhanta in uh, uh, Cambodia is uh, onomastics, that's to say the study of the names. Uh, so this is a mandala which is not a real mandala. It's just a diagram for myself to remind myself of where these names are on a mantra. The, the mantras are on uh, a lotus mandala that are possible and common. Um, and we have, um, so again, returning to Pondicherry, and we have a number of manuscripts of uh, an important text called the Sarvagyanotra Tantra. This Sarvagyanotra Tantra is also mentioned at least twice in the Cambodian epigraphic record uh, by name. And uh, it's w it, 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 this is a passage which uh, we have an early 9th century manuscript from Nepal, but it's very fragmentary, and this portion is not transmitted there. But it's there in the manuscripts we have in Pondicherry. And uh, what it's talking about is how you get an initiation name. So, uh, uh, one should uh, bind uh, un the eyes, uh, understand, of the shishya, of the disciple who's receiving initiation. So, one should lead him, this shishya, such that he faces the southern face of God, dakshinamultim, uh, holding a, uh, a, a little collection of flowers. Shivasyabhimokam uh, stapya, when positions him in front of Shiva, in other words, Shiva in the mandala, uh, then you cause him to throw his flowers, blindfold. Yasmin patanti pushpani namagotram tadatmakam. Wherever, wherever the flowers fall, uh, that his name and gotra will be the n uh, will be that. Samantra siddhyati tasya shiva nama padanti kam. So that mantra. Uh, becomes established, Siddhati, for him, i.e. as his name, ending in uh, Shivanamapada, Shivanamapada Antikam, in other words, ending in the name Shiva. And sure enough, uh, we find plenty of examples in South India of uh, this type of name uh, which is described in this ritual passage. These names like Aghor Shiva, Tatpurusha Shiva, Dharma Shiva, and so forth, they're all instances where we have a mantra which could be on the mandala, followed by the element Shiva. Uh, this is a collection of names in Cambodian inscriptions from different periods, and you see lots and lots of the same type. Uh, I prepared this from some other presentation. This is about, uh, n uh, so that all the ones in different colors here, these blue ones, for example, uh, Shikha Shiva, classical uh, name, Shikha is a mantra, Shiva is the ending. Uh, it's actually preceded by this Khmer name, Si and Go, which uh, indicate that these people were slaves. Uh, that's to say, slaves, Okay, we don't know what slave means. I mean, it shifts meaning in many cultures and so forth. But clearly these are people who were given, it's recorded on temple walls and temple inscriptions that they were given to a given uh, deity. Anyway, so uh, we have a large quantity of evidence pointing to uh, Shaiva naming conventions in the epigraphic corpus. Uh, this is just one example. I could give you others. 
Okay, this is the inscription I was hoping I would come to. I think I have a few minutes left. So this is a, an enormous inscription from a temple called the Mebon. Uh, do I have any pictures of it? Yes, so that's, a, I'm afraid, a distant view through the jungle canopy. The Mebon was actually, this looks like jungle, but it's the middle of an enormous tataka, an enormous tank, uh, and the Yashodhra tataka, uh, built by Yashovarman, a uh, king in the ninth century. And in the middle of this, uh, a certain other king called Rajendra Varman built uh, this temple and some other things, of course, and uh, produced this enormous stella, two faces, again entirely in Sanskrit. Uh, the thing has been badly damaged. Uh, and uh, when I told colleagues of mine in Cambodia that I was interested in it, they very kindly arranged to have it taken away from the storage and then uh, disassembled <laughs> into pieces in the National uh, Museum in Phnom Penh and then built up again. Uh, you can see it was quite a business. I even helped at certain points. Uh, and then uh, I spent a, a very uh, enjoyable, peaceful, happy week uh, in uh, Phnom Penh beside the inscription. You can see a little bit of how delicate the engraving is, how beautiful the thing is. That's the, just this tiny corner here. A uh, very amazing object. Uh, it was published in uh, 1925 by Louis Fino. But the, uh, so I'm not going to read the French translation or anything. This is just part of the introduction. And what I wanted to emphasize was that in those early days, I think, uh, of Cambodian epigraphy, people were really interested just in zipping through the whole thing and taking out whatever information there was about regnal history or events or something. And this inscription is uh, 218 elaborate verses in Sanskrit, very erudite, very difficult, but has almost no information. And so I think it was judged to be very uninteresting. <laughs> and uh, you can see that, uh, therefore, there are many problems that are not really solved. Uh, and now I think that this, this verse is, in fact, terribly interesting. But it's so complicated, I'm not sure that I will be able to take you through, particularly if everybody has observations, which would be great. But I think that this is a, uh, the kind of verse that I was just referring to in response to uh, Professor Bahulka's question just now. I think very often uh, there is a superficial meaning of uh, these verses which springs to the eye and then there is something inevitably uh, tricky and uh, something which calls your attention and you have to reread it and then you see that there is a tantric meaning behind. And this is one of these cases. So here this is the superficial meaning, if you like, uh, of this verse. So, at first I'll read it. Eka pra kalaham sa vibhrama gati kanton mana ya sati bhittwaan gam gaganod gatatma rataye yata navatvam puna padmam mana sa sambhritam nijaruji pro jimbhitam vibhrati sorry sa shakti shiva sangato daya kari gauri para patu ya vaha sorry uh, we had to clear up a few readings. There's some things which were wrongly read. Uh, so formally, Prak, uh, I think that this often indicates mythological allusion. So once upon a time, the beloved of Shiva, Kanta, Sati, that we know was her name, uh, uh, who was alone, Eka, whose gate has the grace of the swan, Kalahamsa Vibhramagati, becoming beside herself, Unmana, with rage, when her husband was not invited to the sacrifice of Duksha, so that's all supplied, she broke forth from her body. So this is the story of the suicide of Sati, Bhitwangam. She rose into the sky, Gaganod Gata, for her own sake, for her own to please herself, Atmaratiyi. And then, Punaha, she renewed herself, literally, Yata Navatwam, she became new as Parvati. May that Shakti, now Gauri, and uh, now no longer Eka, but Shiva Sangata, in union with Shiva, may she protect you, Patuvaha. She who is Udayakari, she, she is propitious, she creates success, and she holds Bibhati, a lotus, Padmam, that she has culled by the lake Manasa, Manasa Sambhritam. I think the idea is we visualize her as having hol holding a lotus that she has picked from the Manasa lake in her hand. A, a lotus which unfolds beneath the radiance of her beauty. Nijaruchi pro jimbhitam. So it you opens forth, this lotus. Uh, in, as a, her own beauty is as strong as the sun. Nijaruchi. So she, like a sun, she shines down on the lotus, it opens. So that's what I think we are supposed to see immediately. Uh, but I think that there is also this second meaning, which is undeniable. <laughs> but you will tell me what you think. Um, 
So being at first alone, uh, a, a, a prak, uh, ekar prak sati, pervading the body up to the head, kanta, so this is ka in the sense of head, ka anta, the shakti of the individual soul, whose graceful movement is that of the sweet-sounding hamsa mantra, kala hamsa vibhramagati. So you know that this, uh, the, the, the mantra in the that we all utter all the time unconsciously is hamsa, this breathing motion that goes in and out all the time. So uh, hence the soul has this hamsa, uh, transformed into the most subtle form of sound, which is called unmana. Now, I have a number of tantric passages which I won't be able to show you, but there is a gradation as we go above. Uh, we saw before chandrabindu, shikha, and then all these more subtle stages so ending in samana, and then unmana is the highest level of shakti, uh, of, of sound becoming increasingly subtle as we perform a full enunciation of the mantra. It becomes increasingly uh, uh, fine, difficult here, and then just a subtle after resonance. And the highest, most uh, a subtle form of this is called unmana. After bursting forth from the body, bhittuangam, rises into the sky, gaganold gata, and now I'm supplying, re and rests in the dvadashanta, because there's this idea that it uh, goes up and then stays outside the physical body, but somehow still inside the aura of the body uh, in the dvadashanta, this space 12 finger breaths beyond uh, the breathing cycle. Uh, it, it's supposed to be the end point of the breathing cycle, this 12 finger breaths away. Uh, it stays there for the pleasure of the soul, atmarati, and then it becomes nine, yata navatvam. It becomes nine in the sense that this shakti descends and occupies the lotus in the heart, which has eight petals and a karnika, a pe pericarp, and those eight petals uh, are occupied by nine shaktis, vama, jeshtha, raudri, and so forth, and then a central one called manonmani. So the idea is that shakti goes up and then comes down, forms this uh, lotus throne, uh, and then is united with Shiva. So this is where Shiva is then enthroned in the heart. Uh, it re and, and it reoccupies the lotus, Bibhati Padmam, which is held in the heart, Manasa Sambhatam, uh, a lotus that has opened because of her light, Nijaruji Projhimbitam. May she protect you, she who brings about ultimate success, Udaya Kari. So, in other words, uh, I think that these verses very often have this tantric meaning. Uh, hidden not very deep behind it, because the verse is quite strange in the first place as a way of describing the myth of Sati. But I think it is strange precisely because it is meant to accommodate this other meaning, this tantric meaning, referring to uh, Shiva as mantra and then Shakti somehow as uh, the former. So I have five minutes, yes. Okay, so uh, maybe I just have time to show you that this is not unique, that we have other inscriptions which do exactly the same thing, where we have Shiva praised in the form of Om, and then Shakti in the form of Unmana. So uh, I think I skip the, the, the sort of proofs which uh, come to me from manuscripts transmitted um, all over the place, but notably in Pondicherry, where there's this great concentration of Shaiva manuscripts. Um, Yes, so this is about the nine, lotus, uh, the nine uh, shaktis on the lotus that should occupy the, 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 the heart when Sadashiva is then seated, enthroned in the heart. Um, okay, so another temple which you might have heard of, uh, this is the temple of Bhante Srey. I think it is arguably the most beautiful Shaiva temple anywhere. Uh, it has a colorful history even in the 20th century, but I won't go into that. It's founded in the same period, uh, a little bit later. The inscription we were just looking at dates from 953. This one dates uh, from 967. Um, I, I would have been nice in a way to show you some of the uh, uh, datings using Indian astronomy because I think some of these are very interesting. Uh, and I realized that with this audience, you are interested in these things, and I would know nothing. So I would, it's a shame in any case I didn't show you some of those uh, problem passages. This is this inscription, uh, very beautifully engraved. It was discovered quite a long time after a monograph was produced about the temple, which is therefore full of misinformation about dates, about stylistics, about uh, everything, unfortunately. But this inscription was then published by Georges Sedes in, in the uh, 60s, I think. And uh, he, so I'm not going to show you his translation. Uh, I think that uh, uh, these are all different proofs, but I think that this is what this is about. Nama shabd gunayastu vyati tendriya vartmane vishwato vyashnuvanaya vyomarupaya shambhavi 
उन्मना या सती कांता नितांत शिव संगता जगद हिताय साशक्त साशक्तिर अचलात्मा जा so I think once again you could read this without having any tantric background and have a certain understanding of one level of meaning but set this beside the other inscription I think it is absolutely certain that it's referring to the same phenomenon that's to say a praise of Shiva as mantra followed by a praise of Shakti who is described again as Unmana Sati and Kanta <laughs> uh, and also Shiva Sangata uh, and in this case, she's Achalatmaja, which I think is a pun. I think Achala means both the mountain Himadri and also Achala in the sense of the, the firm syllable, Dhruva, the Om, the Pranava, can also be referred to as Achala. Okay, so I'm not going to go into the details, but you see the point. Uh, this is another case where, using much of the same vocabulary, we have the same uh, phenomenon. Um, this is a, uh, very briefly, I'm going to conclude, I think I still have five minutes, no? A couple of minutes, okay. So I hope I will finish in that. Uh, this, this inscription is very, very beautiful and fascinating, and one of the things that happens in it is, it's a man called Yagyavara who, who, command, who orders his younger brother, uh, called uh, Vishnu Kumara, I think, to copy various texts. And this is one of the places where he mentions some of the texts that explicitly this man was enjoined to copy by his elder brother. And um, uh, so the, the, the verse uh, says, Vidya santavit chitya kritsnam vrittim chakashikam parameshwara purvam cha yo likhat shiva samhitam. So yo yaha is uh, Vishnu Kumara who copied uh, Alikhat, uh, what did he copy? Kritsnam Vrittim uh, Chakashikam, the entire Kashikavritti, and I think this refers to the famous gram grammatical work, the Kashikavritti of Vamanan Jayaditya, and also the Samhita, the Shiva Samhita, whose name is preceded by the element Parameshwara, Parameshwara Samhita. So it so happens that we have this ninth century manuscript of the Parameshwara in Cambridge, and I think that it's reference to this uh, document, I'm uh, not this document, but this text transmitted fragmentarily in this manuscript. And uh, so the one thing I've admitted here is this vidya santa tavit for the non-interruption, the non-cutting off, a vichitya of vidya santati, of the continuity of knowledge. Uh, and that's what I wanted to conclude with. You can see that the, the passage is here, vidya santa tavit I hope you can sort of see that. Uh, and uh, it's that passage, yes. So that there should be no break in the transmission of knowledge. And this was the point I wish to stop because the really remarkable thing about Cambodia is that it produced these extraordinary documents, extraordinary inscriptions of very high learned quality and that uh, Sanskrit uh, learning uh, grammar, you mentioned Sushruta, I think that Sushruta in fact is mentioned for the first time in that Meibon inscription of the 10th century by name. But there are many other references of course to medicine, to astronomy absolutely plentiful because of all the dates, uh, all these different disciplines and not one scrap survives other than the inscriptions. In other words, Cambodia has entirely lost its manuscript transmission. And it's something that could happen here because nobody is copying these things anymore. And as Professor Dash was outlining earlier this morning, there is a sort of strange uh, situation, paradoxically, we're in a position now to read all these things which we could never have had access to before because of photography, because of travel and so forth. And it coincides with a very devastating loss of interest on the part of uh, very many people who might have been interested, it seems. And so this is a real danger. In spite of this uh, eagerness to not have uh, knowledge interrupted, <laughs> uh, this vidya santa tavichitya as a motivation for copying, uh, it can happen. A whole, an enormous uh, area of the world can lose entirely its uh, uh, intellectual tradition. So, thank you very much. I don't know whether I can find it again, but uh, way back there I referred to this passage of the Nishwasa where it's made explicit uh, from context, I would say, that uh, there's a sort of, maybe I won't find it, but uh, 
this rite called Sakali Karana, where the ini so this, the, you you know this principle uh, widespread in tantric uh, mm, uh, worship that you cannot worship the deity without first identifying yourself with the deity. So, uh, na rudro rudra marchayet, for example. You see various versions of this. You cannot worship rudra if you are not yourself first rudra. So, what that uh, it takes the form of uh, a rite called uh, that that finally. It, uh, is in somehow expressed through a ritual called Sakalikarana, where you transform yourself into the Sakala form of the deity by imposition of the mantras. And in uh, the, the pa passage I quoted from the Nishwas is a passage of what would in later texts be called Sakalikarana, involving Matrika, the alphabet, as mantra, and of the Matrika, which is the most generic of all uh, tantric mantras, uh, you take the vowels and you lay them onto one side of your body and the consonants onto the other and you then become, as it were, uh, Ardhanarishwara, uh, Yoni and Bija on both sides. And uh, it's very clear from, not just from there, but from one or two other lines in the same chapter that Yoni and Bija in the tradition of the Nishwasa represent vowels and consonants. There are, of course, manuscripts surviving in Cambodia, but they are all of a... Um, of, uh, Theravada Buddhism or ancillary texts of Theravada Buddhism, texts in Khmer. There, are, as as far as I know, no manuscripts survive in Sanskrit. And of course, in well, it's certainly clear that there have been big. Uh, political ructions across Cambodia and Southeast Asia has had a lot of well, big, big breaks. Well, I mean, I think that throughout history, Southeast Asia has known these big changes, periods of terrible uh, disruption. And uh, it seems that there is no Sanskrit uh, inscription from after the 13th century. And then there are no, but there's uh, some continuity, Chinese travelers accounts in, indicate that through the, the 13th century, uh, the, still the same culture. There's uh, some dispute about exactly when uh, everything was uh, effectively lost. It takes a little while. I mean, I think that it would have to be uh, 100 years or so of total neglect, and then it would also be lost yes. in other places here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the ro in the cave on the way up to the yeah. Uchi Vinayaka temple, yes. Because it's the only one that you know, has the double interpretation that you know, lends itself to that. I know of here, but this the whole class of them apparently in Mongolia. I think that in fact, in, uh, so the, the, the rock, in, the, the inscription in Trichy is particularly famous because everybody debates about whether or not there is a linga, for example, whether the linga means linga or what it might mean. But uh, in fact, many uh, uh, other inscriptions, both of the Chalukas and Pallavas, are full of puns. I think particularly puns in which the king is shown to be in some respects similar to Vishnu, or puns that uh, equate him or imply an equation with some hero of the Mahabharata. I think that these puns are very common. What is a little bit unusual, I think, for Cambodia is, is the very pronounced uh, allusions to all these branches of learning, Sanskritic learning, the very pronounced allusions specifically to Shaiva branches of learning, both uh, Parshapata, I haven't shown any of those today, and also Mantra Marga, and not only of the Shaiva Siddhanta. I think that is rather less visible, though certainly also visible, in various inscriptional corpora from the different parts of the Indian subcontinent. But the punning, the sort of dense uh, bitextuality, is quite common also in, in some Indian epigraphy. Yes, I'm going to